Hi everybody. Welcome to our next presentation on the principle of restoration. I hope you've been enjoying our lecture series and I hope that by now you're starting to realize hey this teaching is really special and I hope that you stick around and make it through the whole lecture series. Our presentation uh, uh, this time is on the principle of restoration and um, we're going to go into the process by which God is now beginning to recover humanity. Uh, we lost God's ideal in the beginning. If you'll recall in our first presentation we talked about Adam and Eve and God gave them the commandment and the responsibility to grow and they were to grow to fulfill the three blessings and they were to establish a true family ideal that would then be the foundation of God's lineage which would end from the family, society, nation, and world, establishing a single sovereignty across the entire world of humanity. What a beautiful culture that would be. But that ideal was lost and then we studied in the fall of man that Adam and Eve turned away from God. They disobeyed his word and then fell into sin. And God's ideal was lost and his lineage was lost, causing God to grieve. Uh, his heart was filled with pain as we learned in Genesis 6.6. 6. Also, Adam and Eve created a family alright, but it was not a godly family. It was not the godly seed that we saw in Malachi 2.15 where God said, I want man and woman to be one because I want a godly seed. But instead we saw a seed of death multiplying from a dead Adam to the family, society, nation, and world. As a result of this, we can say that fallen man is in the midway position. We were created under a godly paradigm, under a godly plan and template, but Satan was able to dominate the love of Adam and Eve. And as a result, sin became the dominant factor driving humanity, creating a history of conflict and war. We can say that this struggle, all conflict in the world, ultimately is rooted in each person. It's the front line of struggle between God and Satan. We see in Romans 7.21 that Paul describes this conflict going on within as a war. So I find this law at work, he says. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me, for in my innermost being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin working within my members. Oh, what wretched man that I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Wow, doesn't that perfectly describe the conflict going on within each individual, each descendant of the dead Adam? Truly it does. And we see this conflict because fallen man in the midway position created by God, God maintaining a claim over man. God didn't just say, that's it, I'm done with these people. God began to work immediately to recover humanity and bring them back to him. However, Satan, through the condition of the spiritual and physical fall, likewise has a claim over humanity. And thus, we see fallen man in between two gods, each with a claim over the same man. We can see that very clearly if you read the book of Job, where we can see that God and Satan are 
engage in a dialogue over the one man, Job. God has one perspective of Job, Satan has another perspective. It's really a metaphor for everyone is in that position. But with two gods having a claim over the same individual, who will claim? Who will claim? You know, when God created the universe, he created this universe for his exclusive sovereignty. He did not create a two masters universe, which is why when Jesus said, man cannot serve two masters, he has to serve God or he has to serve Satan. And that's uh, representative of the nature of the universe. It is not a dual master universe. So fallen man is in the midway, midway position claimed by two gods, but two gods will not simultaneously claim that individual. Therefore, fallen man in the midway position will play a role to establish which god will be the God of exclusive claim, exclusive sovereignty. We will play a role in doing that. And what is the condition that we have to produce? We see clearly in Matthew 7, 24 that Jesus says, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. God wants to claim us. We know that God so loved the world that God wants to claim us to his side. But God will not exert that claim unless we make a condition to separate from Satan. And that condition is the word. Whether uh, in the Old Testament context or the New Testament context, the principle is the same. Whether the word is the law or the word is the word made flesh, the principle is the same. We have to receive that word, we have to believe that word, and then most important, we have to put that word into practice. In the Old Testament context, we can see Deuteronomy 28. If you believe the laws and decrees and commandments of God, Israel, thou art, will be blessed. But if you do not, then you will be cursed. And we can see that clearly in their history. Whenever they upheld the words and decrees, the laws and decrees and commandments of God, then God could lead them by a pillar of fire at night, a pillar of cloud by day. But when they would violate and break trust with God through rejecting his word, then God would stand back and not be able to exert his desire to set up his exclusive claim over them. So the word, believe it, put it into practice, is really the principle behind salvation. It is the principle behind salvation. In the Old Testament, God is training the people via that principle. And when Christ comes, that principle is manifested in substance. So that is the key process of restoration. Again, emphasizing that we must play a part. Although grace is a free gift, it's not cheap. It's not cheap. So we have to do our part in order that God's will that no one perish be realized. And so that good condition is to receive God's word, believe it, put it into practice, and accomplish God's will that all men be saved. For none, God is not willing that anyone should perish. Now it would be good if we could just conclude with that and say, you know what? Just keep making those good conditions, folks, and everything will work out just fine. But we know that there's another reality over here. This guy over my uh, left shoulder, uh, Satan. Satan is also busy at work. 
He's sending his word. Likewise, he wants to have an opportunity to be set up as our exclusive God. And he follows the same methodology. Isn't that what he did with Eve? He sends his word. If we make the condition to believe that word, and if we put that word into practice, uh-oh, now we've made the opposite of a, bad, of a good condition. We've made a bad condition. And through that condition, we set up Satan as our exclusive master. And we enter into a relationship with that master through that bad condition. And what is that? That's what we would call sin. Sin is any thought or action that makes a base for Satan to have give and take with me. It's a condition. It's a condition that opens the door for Satan to establish his exclusive claim and exercise it over us. When we sin, we become a slave to sin. Because sinning involves, or is predicated upon, first, rejecting God's word. And we know that keeping God's word is the foundation of freedom, the foundation of, of uh, our life, it's the foundation of love. It's all those things and more. So when we separate from God's word, when we reject God's word and turn towards the devil and receive his word, inevitably we're eroding the foundation of our freedom and our love. That's why the consequences of sin are described uh, being comparable to slavery. He who sins is a slave to sin. It's why sin becomes a habit. Because ultimately all sins are, on, are, are committed on the foundation of violating God's word. And thus all sin is involved in the destruction of freedom. And the evidence of that is that all sin is the beginning of habit. I got to do it. I can't stop sinning. I don't have the choice or the freedom. Once I've gone into sin, now I have an inordinate desire. All inordinate desires are rooted in the condition of sin based upon the rejection of God's word. And so God intervenes in our life. Satan instead invades. Big difference. God intervenes. Satan invades. And he invades in a very vicious way and leads us down the primrose path of self-destruction through self-destructive behavior. So we have to walk a course to separate from Satan and to come back to God's side. God won't just reach into this area where we have gone, but God will call us to return to him through a condition of indemnity. We have to set up a condition of indemnity. God won't walk into Satan's area and say, and grab our hand and say, hey, come with me. Why is that? Because did God create the condition of sin that brought us there? Who did that? We did it. And because we made that condition of sin, we have to reverse it and unbind it through a condition of indemnity. And therefore, indemnity conditions restores our original position and status. Indemnity is the reverse course of the way of sin. Let's look at indemnity conditions uh, first beginning in the Old Testament context. In Leviticus 26, 40 to 43. But if they confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob they will pay for their sin because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. So there is a way 
once the people go into the uh, enter into a relationship with Satan through their bad condition, there is a way to unbind that through indemnity, which also is uh, mentioned or implied here in 2 Samuel 14.14, 14, which says that God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. See that? So though a person enters into Satan's area through his own condition, God will devise a way for that person to come back to him. But it won't be God just going in there and grabbing them by the hair and dragging them himself. No, the sinner will play a role in his restoration. Very important for us to understand that role. Certainly a limited role, but an important central role nevertheless. Um, let's cite a few examples here. Um, when we make a condition of sin, it's a certain process. And that process usually involves, you know, a very, um, very good feeling and uh, a process involving self-gratification. I mean, how would we describe a condition of sin? I mean, we can talk about sin all day. But, but think about sin, how, how it is. What, what is a typical way to describe sin? Basically, it's something that feels good, seems good, tastes good. Sounds good. And it involves immediate self-gratification and subtly involves compromising a standard that is laid down by God. Subtly involves focusing on my interests at the expense of the interests of others who are near and dear to me. My family, my friends, my community, my nation, my world, my God. That's basically all sin follows that kind of principle. So if we make a condition of sin, which, you know, we do make, and that condition of sin leads us into a covenant with Satan, and our relationship with Satan is predicated upon that foundation of the condition of sin that we made, then there is a way in God's principle to liquidate the foundation upon which Satan is exerting his exclusive claim over me. And we call that the way of indemnity. So by the condition of sin, we walk a pleasant course into Satan's area. And through the way of indemnity, we reverse that course of sin. We made the condition of sin, we have to lay the indemnity condition. Now, if sin is a pleasant course, feels good, tastes good, seems good, sounds good, and that course leads in, then the course that leads out How's that going to be, you think? Going to seem good, feel good, taste good, sound good? Or is it going to taste bad, sound bad, feel bad? Is it going to be 40 days of fasting? Is it going to be a cold water, freezing water bath? Is it going to be prayer 3 o'clock in the morning and not 3 o'clock in the afternoon? That's the way of indemnity conditions. It's the opposite of sin. It's bringing on to oneself a suffering that is focused on the sake and benefit of others. And because it's the reverse course through indemnity, then we can see that fallen people can restore their position and status with God. So through the condition of sin, we come into Satan's area. Let's think of an example. In the, let's, let's start in the Old Testament context. Because the Old Testament is really 
laying down the principles which will be substantial, substantialized by Christ. But definitely we can see the principle being laid down in the Old Testament. When the Israelites would sin, for example, when they worshiped the golden calf, well, they're toast. Stick a fork in them. They're done. And Moses comes down from the mountain. Wow. He's totally lost control over the people. So what happens? Immediately God begins to work and sets up a condition of indemnity to sever their relationship with Satan, which was established through condition of worshiping the golden calf. And what was that condition of indemnity? It's expressed in Exodus 32, 20 to 35. They had to burn the golden calf. They had to crush it. They had to drink it. It did not taste good at all. And through this condition of indemnity, then God could receive his people once again. Perfect example. We can think of another example with the Israelites in their history. When they got to the border of the promised land a little while later, they sent in the spies for 40 days. But then they engaged in a rebellion against Moses at the border. And so through that condition of sin, they set up Satan as their exclusive God. But God again began to work through the condition of indemnity. What was that condition of indemnity for the Israelites in this case? In Numbers 14, 19 to 35. For every day of that 40 day period where they were to keep faith, they had to wander in the wilderness for a year per day. So 40 days, 40 years. So through that 40 year period of wandering in the wilderness, they set up the condition of indemnity to pay for the sin of rebellion which they performed at the borderline. So through that process then, they were able to restore or recover their relationship with God. Well, this is a tremendous hope. God is showing us that there is a way that he is devising so that a banished person or people may not remain estranged from him. So we want to take a look at this in terms of the restoration of the true family ideal. Now I wish I could say, so there you have it, brothers and sisters, just pay indemnity and you can come back to God. Will that work? Yes and no. What is our fundamental problem as far as sin? It's a sin that we didn't commit. It's a sin that we inherited. And we inherited that sin via our ancestral connection to a dead Adam. You didn't commit the original sin. You inherited the original sin. So in fact, the principle of indemnity requires a reverse course. That's why we ourselves cannot save ourselves. We ourselves cannot set up a condition of indemnity to pay for the original sin. And why not? Because you weren't in the Garden of Eden. You, <laughs> you didn't commit the original sin, but you got it through your ancestral connection to the dead Adam. Thus, the reverse course to resolve our historical problem is through a living Adam. We need a new ancestor to come. We need a new Adam who is not dead, who is alive. And then we have to figure out a way to get into his lineage, to become his descendant. Some kind of graft process is required. That's the way of restoration. That's the law of indemnity, the law of reverse course. So it is the law of indemnity that determines the way that Christ will come 
in the manner in which he comes. So God has to uh, recover a dead Adam. You know, Adam began his life as a living Adam. You know, he was born without sin. He was sinless, a sinless Adam. And he received God's word and was uh, going along the way of growth towards the ideal. But then this Adam made some bad conditions, didn't he? This Adam made some bad conditions and fell into death. So Adam, through bad conditions, was transformed from a living Adam to a dead Adam. Thus, in the process of restoration, a dead Adam must be transformed from a dead Adam into a living Adam through a reverse course. Now, that's what has to take place historically. In other words, a foundation for the Messiah must be laid before, in fact, the Messiah will come. That's why Jesus, who came to bring rebirth to mankind, did not arrive immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve, did he? As a matter of fact, we see it took 4,000 biblical years before Jesus arrived. And before Jesus arrived, this 4,000 biblical year period, we see that other biblical figures appear, like Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses and Joshua, judges, the period of judges, judges like Samuel. Then came the king, Saul, David and Solomon. And then the period of prophets, and uh, finally, we see right before Jesus the coming of John the Baptist. This was the foundation for the Messiah. And this foundation involved many biblical central figures being called by God to accomplish many important tasks. And we need to know what those tasks were. What was the mission of Abel? What was the mission of uh, Noah and all these central figures. You know, as we said, Adam began his life as a living Adam. And then he made certain conditions which transformed him from a living Adam into a dead Adam. This happened by conditions, bad conditions. His own bad conditions changed him from here to here. So if we can reverse these bad conditions, we can restore a dead Adam to a living Adam. That's what the foundation for the Messiah is. And that's Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Judges, Kings, Prophets, John the Baptist. That's their mission. Their mission is to restore through indemnity the bad conditions made by Adam that transformed a living Adam into a dead Adam. That's their mission. Each one through this 4,000 year period of restoration. And if those conditions can be reversed through indemnity, what that represents, symbolically speaking, is a dead Adam can be restored to the position of a living Adam. Now what that means in substance is that if these central figures are successful to reverse through indemnity the bad conditions of Adam, then the foundation for the Messiah will be established on that foundation. And that will be the moment in history when that is accomplished that Christ Jesus will appear. That's why it took 4,000 years for Christ to come. What was God waiting for? He was waiting for the foundation for the Messiah to be established by these providential central figures. And what is that foundation? It's the indemnity conditions to reverse 
the bad conditions made by Adam that changed him from a living Adam to a dead Adam. And because indemnity conditions are the reverse process, then it stands to reason. Once those conditions are laid, the foundation for a living Adam to reemerge will be established. That living Adam is then the Christ who brings rebirth to all mankind. The next question then is, what was Adam's bad condition? What were those bad conditions that Adam made? We have to be clear about Adam's responsibility. What was his mission? What was he to accomplish? First, he was to accomplish a foundation of faith. He had to have faith in God's word. God gave him the word. He had to apply that word to himself. That was a foundation of his freedom. That was a foundation of his authority over his body. That was the pathway for him to enter into the dimension of love and dominion. He was to make a foundation of faith with God's word. And we uh, studied this course. God uh, put the fruit in their midst, but we now know what that means. The fruit is love. And God was challenging Adam and Eve to exert authority over their bodies. And so he gave them the instrument of his word and ignited the power and potential of faith within them. And so they were authorized by God's word to exercise dominion over their body. And by exercising dominion, self-control, self-discipline, that was the foundation of self-government. But self-government is the foundation of freedom. And freedom is the foundation to be able to experience love and to perfect love. That was the dynamic of the foundation of faith. So we know that he didn't accomplish that. Had he accomplished that, he would have moved into the second area of responsibility in the foundation of substance. We see it again reflected in um, 1 Corinthians 15.27 where it says that God placed all things under the sun and rules through the sun. That's the elder son's birthright and the elder son's dominion. Substantially, he becomes like the external form, the exact representation of God. And God exerts authority and dominion and rules all things, including the angels, through the position of the Son. And that's exactly what Lucifer, if you'll recall, was struggling with. He couldn't accept this new emerging dominion of the Son of God and refused to come to God through the position of Adam. So Adam lost that position, the dominion of the elder son. And uh, this is what we took a look at in um, our presentation on the fall, the uh, process of the fall. Do you recall this? That Adam and Eve started out immature, the archangel had a limited authority over them, but when they began to grow, the positions changed. You know, the gar in, in the garden there was a change of order and a new order was established by God where the Son would exercise dominion. And of course later we see that Jesus is the one who, though tempted in every way, did not sin. And thus it was Jesus who established that dominion. God placed all things, including the angels, under the Son. So Adam faltered from this position. And so uh, uh, rather than exercising dominion over the angel, he lost dominion to the angel, right? He became a slave to sin and the servant, the angel, became God and ruler over the Son of God. And so through these two bad conditions, Adam was transformed from a living Adam into a dead Adam. Those were the bad conditions that he made. Bad condition number one, broke faith with God's word and lost the foundation of faith. Bad condition number two, he lost the first son's dominion, gave up the dominion of the elder son. 
and so that God could not rule. That's why the creation has been groaning in travail, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. So these two conditions must be uh, reversed through indemnity. Through indemnity conditions, the foundation of faith, faith in God's word, and the elder son's dominion must be restored through a reverse course of restoration. And that will be the foundation upon which Christ will emerge. When the central figure in the uh, era leading up to Christ accomplishes this condition of indemnity and establishes this foundation, that will be the foundation upon which Christ will emerge. This is the principle of restoration. This will then shed light onto uh, the process of restoration. Let's take a look then in uh, this 4,000 year period where the foundation of faith was being restored. And this will help us to understand why God is calling central figures to perform such amazing conditions of faith. First we need a central figure like Abel, like Noah, like Abraham. And then God will call that central figure in the early years to offer an animal sacrifice, which we would call a conditional object. Or like Noah, to build the ark. Some kind of condition of faith over a time period. And it's a test. It's a, a great condition of indemnity. Imagine having to build an ark for 120 years on a mountain. You know, when there's not a cloud in the sky, that takes great faith. Abel had to offer the best of his flock. Abraham, Abraham had to make a great condition of faith, didn't he? When he had to offer his son, Isaac. So the central figure called by God, in a sense that central figure is a stand-in for the dead Adam. The Adam who lost the foundation of faith and the loss and lost the foundation of substance, the central figure, be it Abel, be it Noah, be it Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, really in a sense represents a repentant Adam taking up the responsibility to indemnify the bad conditions that he made with the hope of making a foundation for God to intervene and send a new living Adam. This is why Abel offered animals, the best of his flock. Noah built the ark. Uh, Abraham offered Isaac. Moses uh, demonstrated 40 years of faith uh, in the uh, palace of the Pharaoh. And uh, the tribes uh, during the, the period of Judges had to uphold the law, the laws, decrees, and commandments of God. They had to establish a foundation of faith. The kings had to establish a foundation of faith with God by keeping the law at all times. John the Baptist had to establish a foundation of faith by leading an ascetic life and preparing a way for the Lord. So all of these central figures are well tested by their faith, aren't they? Isn't that what the 11th chapter of Hebrews testifies to? That they were well tested by their faith. They had to make this condition of faith because Adam, Adam and his initial failure was the loss of faith. So the central figure restoring that foundation of faith must then move on to the next condition, which is to restore the elder son's dominion, the birthright of the elder son, that he may take his true position. And again, how was that lost? The archangel, who is ultimately in the servant position, was dealing with an Adam and an Eve who were maturing. So for a while, he exerted a limited conditional dominion over them. But once they started to mature, the positions changed. And now Adam was to be the central person through which even the angels must find their way to God. And that's what precipitated the fallen reaction on the part of Lucifer, didn't it? 
And that didn't end until the archangel actually became God and ruler over Adam. God had given his commandment to Adam. And Adam through Eve was to exercise dominion through the authority of God's word over the angel. But the angel reversed that dominion. The angel rejected God's word and then changed positions over the Son of God. And what was the result? Is that Adam became a slave to sin and the archangel became God and ruler. So in the process of the foundation of substance and restoring the first son's birthright, God will go the re reverse course. God will set up the position of firstborn and secondborn. In Adam's family, it was Cain and Abel. Cain is the firstborn. Abel is the secondborn. But in restoration, the secondborn is going to represent Adam, and the firstborn will represent the archangel. What did the archangel do? He reversed the natural bloodline. Adam became a slave. The angel who was a servant became God. What does God do? He reverses the natural order of the, of the bloodline, affecting restoration and indemnity. That's why we see God calling both Cain and Abel to make an offering, didn't he? And whose offering did he receive? He changes their position, receives Abel's offering, and does not receive Cain's offering. Now Cain is very upset by that, right? Hey, he didn't accept my offering. What is God telling him? God speaks to Cain in Genesis 4, 6 to 7. He says, if you do what is right, you will be received. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Satan is sympathizing with Cain and is right there with Cain. Why is that? Why is Cain, Satan sympathizing with Cain? Because Cain is being compelled to do what Lucifer couldn't do. What does God want Cain to do? He's saying, I want you to come to me through Abel. I've received your younger brother. Now I want you to come to me through this younger son. Now why is that difficult for Cain? I don't want to come to God through my younger brother. There was a time when I was the eldest and I could go... Do God has put him exactly in the same position that Lucifer had been. What is God seeking to accomplish? God wants Cain to separate from Satan. And how does Cain separate from Satan? This is the key. This is the key. Satan didn't just go let him go and say, have a nice day. The only way to separate from Satan is to find out what Satan won't do and do it. And see, this is what God is setting up with Cain and Abel. He's setting up a circumstance, a path that he knows Satan will not follow. Because what is Satan's dominion and sovereignty and personality based upon. It's based upon the inability to come to God through Abel or through Adam. That's why God sets up the younger over the elder, encourages the elder, come on, come to me through this position. Because you know what happens? If you can do that, this old boy is going to drop off. And so where the elder can come to God through the younger, Satan is separated. This is the paradigm of salvation. Satan is separated because he can't come to God through Adam. That's the key. That's the process of the reverse course. That's the way of indemnity. And that unity of younger and elder would make the foundation for the Messiah. Christ would come on that foundation. But unfortunately, Cain kills Abel. Cain kills Abel.
So we see this pattern in biblical history, the struggle of younger and elder with Cain and Abel. We'll see it with Shem and Ham in Noah's family. We'll see it with Isaac and Ishmael, the first generation uh, under um, uh, Abraham. Isaac, the younger, Ishmael, the elder. And from these two lines, this comes the Judeo-Christian line, from Ishmael comes the Islamic world. So the two brothers are still struggling in the world today. Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau engage in the same kind of conflict and struggle as Cain and Abel. And we'll take a look at that very soon. How about in, even inside the womb? Perez and Zira, inside the womb of Tamar. The two brothers change positions and the younger the younger is born first. How about that? Inside the womb. There's so many examples. Moses and the Israelites. The Israelites were referred to by God as my firstborn. And they had to follow Moses. Or other interesting examples, even on the national level. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. Cain and Abel on the national level. Or even at the time of Jesus. Herod was a descendant of Esau. John the Baptist was a descendant of Jacob. So the relationship of Herod and John the Baptist was already established as a pattern in the relationship of Jacob and Esau. That means there'd be a tendency for Herod to want to kill John the Baptist. And we see, of course, we know that in fact he did. So this providence could not be accomplished at the time of Cain and Abel. So God recreated this foundation at a later time in history and Esau and Jacob were called to carry out this dispensation. In a sense it's almost like the second coming of Jacob and Esau. God has recreated the circumstances faced by Cain and Abel because again the mission is the same. Lay the foundation of faith, indemnify Adam's first failure, lay the foundation of substance, indemnify Adam's second failure, make the foundation for the Messiah, Christ will come on that foundation. So God recreates those circumstances. And in the same way, Esau at first, just like Cain, tries to kill Jacob, but this time He's not successful because Jacob and his mother were very well united and she protected Jacob. However, about 20, 21 years later, we see through a very amazing story which in our more in-depth lectures will go very much in depth in this area. It's fascinating the process by which Jacob and Esau united. But in our, our, our key point here is that finally at the end of this dispensation of 21 years, Esau and Jacob unite. And so the unity of Jacob and Esau affects a separation from Satan. Satan could not follow Esau as he humbled himself and came to God through unity with his younger brother. Amazing. God had predicted it, even when they were in the womb, that the elder must serve the younger. Well, something dramatic happened on that foundation. Now we have the foundation of faith, the foundation of substance, indemnified. After so much effort, almost 2,000 years, now God has the foundation for the Messiah on this victory. And so Jacob is given a new name. Israel. Wow. That's how Israel became the chosen nation. Not because they won a lottery, but because in their history was a condition to separate from Satan, to be sanctified, so God could intervene. You remember our, our, our first point in this presentation? That God won't intervene as long as Satan has a condition to keep a hand on a person or a family or a nation. So God worked a providence of restoration through indemnity to separate Israel from Satan. So through 
Jacob and Esau's condition of faith and substance, a foundation was made that was separated from Satan, and so God could intervene upon the foundation of the man and family of Israel. And he began to intervene in a very dramatic way. Israel had 12 sons. 12 sons, which became 12 tribes. And then through a central line, through Judah, and then from Judah through um, Tamar, Zerah, and Perez, inside the womb of Tamar, engage in another fascinating foundation for the Messiah. Again, where the elder and younger change positions, the blood order is changed, and the foundation for the Messiah is made. Well, where was that foundation in the womb first made for God's bloodline to be established? That's in the womb of Tamar. When Zira and Perez change positions inside the womb, Zira sticks his hand out, and his firstborn. They tie a red cord around it. He goes back into the womb. Now I've asked many doctors and uh, midwives, have you ever seen this happen? No, I've never seen that happen. Stuck his hand out, got a red cord around it, pulls it back in, and then the younger brother comes out first. So inside the womb, the dominion of the firstborn is restored. That's really ultimately the foundation for the coming mother of Jesus, Mother Mary. She inherits that foundation 40 generations later, exactly. And 40, we know, very common and prevalent number associated with conditions of indemnity and purification, like 40-day fast and other things. So 40 generations later, Jesus is born as the sinless Son of God. What was the fundamental foundation for the Messiah? That fundamental foundation was accomplished through Jacob's victory. So he made the tribal and family foundation for the Messiah. In our next presentation, we're going to look at what God does after this. How God expands his foundation to the national level, centering on Moses, and how God carries that foundation through the next 1,600 years to make a foundation on the national and world level for the coming of Christ. We'll also take a look a little bit more at the lineage of Jesus, which is really fascinating. How God prepared the womb of Mary to receive the invocation of the Holy Spirit and to make the foundation for the return into the world of a sinless Son of God. I hope you find this interesting, and I hope you'll stick around for our next presentation. Have a nice day.